All right, good morning. We uh, have the theme for our worship today is our security in Christ. Uh, that could be worded in many ways, uh, eternal security, perseverance of the saints, but we are secure in Christ if your faith Indeed, is in Christ alone, through his grace alone, your faith alone, for God's glory alone, you are God's child. And nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Amen? So we're going to sing uh, songs about that. Our scripture readings and our sermon are about the security that we have in Christ. It all comes together to recognize that God will accomplish what he set forth in his plan. God will fulfill his promises to us. And we are his people, and uh, we rejoice to, to call him our Lord. And so we were going to start with singing Jesus Saves. It's the old, old hymn that uh, we're familiar with. We'll sing three stanzas of that. Let's go ahead and stand together if you'd like to, if you're able to, and let's just sing Jesus Saves. There we've heard the joyful sound. All the time, God is good. You may be seated. Drew is going to come and do our call to worship, and the uh, passage that we've selected for our reading today is Isaiah 53, which, of course, is the well-known suffering servant passage. It prophesies the coming of Christ, the Messiah, and him bearing or him being beaten and bruised and battered. But the significant part is it was for our iniquities that he was bruised and beaten and battered. It was for our iniquities, our chastisement was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. And so as we, uh, as Drew reads that for us, let's meditate on it because Peter uses this passage, Isaiah 53, and he reflects upon it in 1 Peter 2. And we'll talk about that in the sermon. So we see a unified thread today um, that, that we're connecting with uh, Isaiah as Peter uses it, and we'll be talking about that in our sermon today. So, Drew, you come and lead us in our call to worship. I don't want to hijack the worship, but uh, before we get into our worship, we have a couple special occasions we want to recognize before we uh, start getting into that. So, um, on June 27th was Pastor and Sue's anniversary, and on July 10th was uh, his birthday. So, we want to recognize him with a couple of gifts for the uh, wedding anniversary and his birthday. We see them, congratulate them. Another year for both of these. So. Yeah, they can come up the stairs. Now we'll go back to worship then. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's always a privilege to, to lead a call to worship here at the church. Thank you for that. I'll say it again, you guys are the greatest people on the planet. Good morning. This morning we are reading from Isaiah 53, starting at verse 3. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as, not, as one from whom men hide their 
face and see with his spies, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When a soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, Make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquity. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this beautiful day that you've given to us and for allowing us to meet here in your house this morning. A place where we can come and lay aside the cares and the current concerns of the world around us and focus on your greatness and the great work of your son on the cross. As we read these verses this morning, we're reminded of this great sacrifice that your son made for us. He took our pain and our guilt and your wrath upon himself in our stead. And we thank you for that this morning. As we sing our songs of worship this morning, we notice that It reminds us of our total dependence on you and your work. I pray that we would be mindful of that this morning. I pray uh, also for Will Gawkin and for Gospel Grace Church in Salt Lake City. I thank you for the work that that church is doing there and for their focus on outreach. I pray that uh, you would be with Will today and his family. I pray that you'd be with the church. Pray that you would uh, bless everything that's that's uh, done there in Salt Lake this morning and for the weeks to come. Be with us this morning as uh, Pastor brings the message. Pray that we would be open and attentive uh, to what you have for us from your Word today. In Jesus' name, Amen. Um, Bible truths: How can we be saved? Only by faith in Jesus Christ and His substitutionary atoning death on the cross. What is faith in Jesus Christ? Receiving and resting on him alone for salvation as he is offered to us in the gospel. What do we believe by true faith? We believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Well, as we continue our thoughts being consumed with security in Christ, we realize that the only way to be at peace with God is through the work of Jesus Christ. And we'll be singing that, and uh, It is the only way to stand before a holy God is to have the robes of Christ's righteousness on you. And so we'll be singing complete in thee. All I have is Christ and he will hold me fast. So I invite you to stand as we lift our voices in unison and celebrate the security that we enjoy through Christ. Thy blood hath pardoned, bought for me, and 
and I am now complete in Thee. May justified, O oh blessed thought, and sanctified salvation wrought. Thy blood hath pardoned, bought for me, and glorified I too shall be. supply and no good thing to me deny since thou my portion lord will be i ask no more complete in me yea justified oh blessed thought and sanctified salvation wrought thy blood hath shall sin, thy grace hath conquered reign within, thy voice shall bid the tempter flee, and I shall stand complete in thee, be justified, O blessed God, and sanctified salvation wrought, thy blood hath Savior, when before thy bar all tribes and tongues assembled are, among thy chosen will I be at thy right hand, complete in me, be justified, O oh blessed God, and sanctified salvation wrought. Thy blood hath pardoned, but for me, and glorified I too shall be. was lost in darkest night, yet thought I knew the way, the sin that promised joy and light had led me to the grave. I had no hope that you would own a rebel to
For the substitutionary, sacrificial, complete atonement that you've made for us. Mm -hmm. Justice has been satisfied. Mm -hmm. God's wrath is quenched. The eternal plan has been fulfilled. The sinless son, the precious lamb of God was slain to remove our sin completely and entirely. All we have to do is to trust you by faith and follow you as our Lord and our shepherd. The work has all been done by your great power, by your loving mercy, by your amazing grace, by your steadfast love. Through the fulfillment of your promises, Lord, we thank you and we praise you that we are secure in you. Lord, that does not give us license to just keep on sinning and do as we please. In fact, the proof of the authenticity of our faith is that we follow you as Lord and Master. We can't just use you as a fire escape and a ticket out of hell and continue to live as we please and satisfy the lusts of our flesh. The proof of a true Christian is that he knows, loves, follows, and pursues the Savior. Lord, we ask that that would be the driving motive of our hearts and the purpose of our life. Now, Lord, we know when we confess that we fall short of that too often than we like to admit, but Lord, we do have to admit it if we're honest with you. And we do have to be honest with you because you see right through us. You know everything about us. Everything is open unto your eyes. And so, Lord, we confess now in this moment that we have strayed from you even this week, even today perhaps. And we've lived selfishly. We've pursued fleshly things. We've pursued the temporal. We've been impatient, unkind, unforgiving, bitter, angry, perhaps used wrong words, evil thoughts. And, Lord, we ask your forgiveness. And while we don't presume upon your grace, we know that that forgiveness and that grace is always available to us because your grace is greater than all of our sin. And so, Lord, it's immeasurable. It's bottomless. And we thank you.
important that nothing that we can do or ever will do will be by our own efforts or by our own power. It is all by your grace. Mm -hmm. So we are utterly and entirely, completely dependent upon you. Not only for our salvation, but also for our sanctification. And Lord, you call us then to enact our will. We are participants in this. And so we ask that you would help us to make right decisions, to determine our will and our life's course and our choices and our thoughts and our words and our actions to be in conformity with the holiness of God. You've called us to be holy for you are holy. And so Lord, again, may we renew and refresh our commitment to you. Cleanse us of our sins and thank you that you are the God of the second chance. And so, Lord, we confess our sins as well as praise you. Lord, our petition is that you would heal our land uh, in this pandemic of COVID virus, of, of all the civil unrest, of all of the political jockeying going on. The only constant that remains is Jesus Christ. God's word. May we as the church reflect that consistency in the way that we live. And Lord, we trust in you. Lord, be with our elections this upcoming year. And we ask that you would help us to be able to live, continue to live in freedom. May our church continue to move forward and, and evangelize and disciple. So, Lord, our trust is in you. And give us grace, no matter what the outcome we pray. May we do our duty to vote. Lord, we ask for hearts that are hurting, hearts that are broken through various trials of life. We ask for bodies that are sick and hurting and frail and feeble at this time. Give strength as the uh, great shepherd and the great physician. Lord, I pray that you give wisdom to us as we have decisions to make. So, Lord, we make our supplication to you for our own needs, but are confident that you hear us, that you know what those needs are, and that you will supply. And for that, we give you thanks. Lord, we pray that you would come quickly, and may we be faithful until you return. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. open our Bibles to uh, 1 Peter in chapter 2 as we continue our study uh, in this particular passage. And if you would like a bookmark, we will also be in Isaiah 53 this morning. So if you have an opportunity to bookmark that, uh, we will refer to that uh, as well. As we've been walking through the book of 1 Peter, uh, we recognize uh, several things that keep recurring. These themes keep recurring. And as I've mentioned before, Peter writes in cyclical fashion rather than linear fashion. Uh, he doesn't write, you know, once upon a time there was a damsel in distress because of a villain and then the hero came uh, and then they lived happily ever after. That's how we think in our Western thought. Uh, it is a storyline in the Bible. It is a way of thinking. And certainly there, those elements are in Peter, but what he's doing, he's taking those particular elements and, and writing about them in certain areas of life, and then he's taking a different area of life and applying those same truths in that area. And then he takes a different area of life and applies those same truths to that area. But he's basically cyclical in his, in his approach. And this is not uncommon uh, in the, the Bible authors. Uh, and so as we look through these things, we see these same truths reappearing. And we can develop what is called a melody line. And we, we've done this before. We'll do it every service because I want you to know what Peter is about by the time we finish, right? Right? Okay. As the elect of God, the outcome of our eternal salvation is secure. Amen? We sang about that today. He will hold me fast, complete in thee, and uh, all I have is Christ because that's all I need. 
Amen? Our eternal security is, or our eternal salvation is secure. Thus, we are sojourners and exiles in this life. Okay? We're planning to go to heaven, but we're still down here. As we travel this earth towards our heavenly inheritance, we follow Christ's example of patiently enduring our trials and resisting the lusts of the flesh. By patiently enduring, living holy lives, loving one another, and by honoring our earthly authorities, we display the gospel to the world and we glorify God in so doing. And so that's what Peter is writing to his audience on those themes taking, again, these basic truths and applying them in certain areas of, of responsibility to life and uh, is repeating them. Chapter 1 is just glorious. It's one of my favorite passages in all of the Bible that he talks about our living hope, our inheritance, the end of our faith is the salvation of our souls, so therefore endure trials. And uh, it's just fantastic. We were bought by the blood of Christ. We were born again by the word of God. That's chapter one. He's laying the foundation of this is who you are. You are faith. Uh, you are a faith community of people who put their faith and trust in Christ as the substitute. And then he tells us in chapter two who we are. We are living stones. We are of Christ who was the living stone, and we also are living stones, rejected of men but accepted by God. We are a chosen race. We are called by God to him to glorify him in this world. We are a royal priesthood to offer holy sacrifices and to proclaim the excellencies of his glory. We are a people for his own possession. We are sojourners and exiles. Don't hold on too tightly to the things of this world because this is not our home. We're just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Right? You know the old chorus. We are submissive citizens. We are, caught, we are taught by, P, by the Holy Spirit through Peter to, to submit to those in authority over us. Uh, governors, emperors, whoever they may be, as long as they don't tell us to break God's law. We are respectful employees, and we discussed that uh, a, la a couple weeks ago and a little bit last week, whereas even though we have a boss that is evil, in matters of work-oriented business, we are to obey him even though that we suffer under his hand. And again, that's not to say we can't change our job or move on, but in the change or while we're under his uh, authority as a boss, we are to behave as a Christian so that we, our good works, display the gospel to him, and who knows but what through our testimony he will come to a knowledge of the gospel, okay? So endure uh, even unjust suffering as uh, uh, an employee under an evil master. And we'll talk about uh, these things today in our text as, by way of review and then move on to our new material. But let's look at our text in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18 uh, through 20, um, 18 through 21, and we'll talk about that. 1 Peter 2, 18, servants be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a what kind of thing? Gracious thing. He will repeat that twice, and that has an important emphasis. For this is a gracious thing. When mindful of whom? God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? I mean, that's your own fault, right? You don't get any credit for that. You just bear the consequences of your stupidity or, your, or, or our sin. But uh, if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. And there's that repeat, repeated phrase, this is a gracious thing. So what we understand in our unjust suffering is that with the inclusio of him calling it a gracious thing, it is only by God's grace that we can accomplish uh, enduring through unjust suffering, right? Again, as I have mentioned before, and I'll say it again because it is so vibrant within our natural self, the old man, our wicked heart, is to when we suffer unjustly, what do we want to do? How do we want to respond? Oh, we want to fight fire with fire, don't we? We want the last word, and we want to give him a peace of mind, and we want to tell him how he's wrong and we're right. And 
Peter says, just endure it because Christ is our example. And we'll get to that in just a moment. The phrase, for what credit is it if when you suffer? That word credit implies the fact that God will reward us. He credits our account when we're suffering unjustly, when we're overlooked, passed by, persecuted, uh, falsely accused, whatever the case may be. Does God know that? What else does God know? He knows everything he chooses to know, right? And so God will reward us for unjust suffering if we take it patiently and endure and by our good works exemplify the gospel and glorify God through those in, un, in times of unjust suffering, okay? We have the example of Christ's unjust suffering. Verses 21 and 22. Look at that section of the paragraph. Verse 21, for to this, what? Unjust suffering. For to this, you have been what? Hmm, pause there for a moment. What have we been called to do? To suffer. Yes, we've been called to salvation. Yes, we've been called to sanctification. Yes, we've been called to proclaim the gospel. Yes, we've been called as ambassadors. Yes, we've been called to glorify God. But part of that calling includes, say it with me, suffering. For to this you have been called, because why? Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you may follow in his steps. So on that note, we recognize that this is our calling. I'm sorry. We have been called to suffer. The whole Bible teaches this truth, doesn't it? Paul says that those that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Jesus said they will hate me because, oh, they will hate you because they hated me, right? And, and Peter is addressing a group of suffering believers. And this is our calling. The Apostle Paul, I read the passage yesterday from Acts 14. Paul and Barnabas went through the churches that they had established on their first missionary journey, encouraging the saints and telling them that they must enter the kingdom of God through suffering. It's part and parcel of our Christian life. We are pilgrims in a foreign land. That means the lords and authorities over us as we read in Ephesians chapter 6, our cosmic powers of this present darkness, right? Therefore, we have to take on the whole armor of God to fight these authorities. And therefore, we're just pilgrims passing through, knowing that we're running through the gauntlet of evil powers. We don't expect a bowl of cherries and a hot fudge sundae for the world to service those things. We are called to suffering because we follow in Christ's steps and the world treated him unjustly. Didn't they? Yes, to what degree did they treat him unjustly? He committed no sin. Neither deceit was found in his mouth. Verse 22, I'm sorry I didn't read that. I should have, I apologize. Let's look at it now. He committed no sin. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. So Peter's emphasizing Jesus' sinlessness again, as well as recorded in other passages by other biblical authors. Jesus Christ was without sin. Can you say amen to that? Therefore, he was the perfect sacrifice, a sinless sacrifice which satisfies God's wrath. All of that is so foundational to our salvation through Christ. But Christ was sinless, and what happened to him? He was killed. He was rejected, even by his own people. They spat in his face and buffeted him in the face with their fists and plucked the beard out, lashed him in his back with a cat of nine tails, placed a crown of thorn on his head, put the heavy cross on his shoulders, made him carry it up to Calvary. They nailed him to a cross, and they mocked him from there. For doing what? No sin. Just shows the animosity of unregenerate people under Satan's power. And by God's grace, you and I were once under Satan's power, right? 
By grace you have been saved, but it is indicative of the reaction of unregenerate people under the influence of Satan to fight, hate, scoff against any type of righteousness whatsoever. Aren't we seeing that today? If you don't know the answer to the question, let me phrase that. We are seeing that today. I'm not going to go into a cultural diatribe. I'll just continue with the gospel. When reviled, he did not revile in return. He did not threaten. What an example that is for us, for us to follow. Again, what is our natural reaction? To respond in anger, to fight fire with fire. But Christ had to ignore his natural response. He was a man, right? He was in all points tempted like we are, Hebrews tells us, yet without sin. So when Christ resisted temptation, did he resist it in his flesh or because he was a cosmic superpower and had a force shield around him that sin couldn't penetrate? He resisted in his, in his humanity. His sinlessness, therefore, was not easily achieved, but through a course of discipline, also by a measure of God's grace. He didn't live inside of a cosmic bubble. That is why he is an example to us of not only unjust suffering, but enduring unjust suffering and enduring the temptation to fight back in an evil response. Again, let me clarify. We can defend ourselves, but we have to do so in the Christian manner. To always trust in God rather than in the arm of our flesh and our smart responses. God gave grace to Christ and promises the same grace to us. Christ is our example. And if we can't attain that example, then he's not an example, right? God says, here's the example to follow. And he wouldn't give us an example to follow if it was impossible to achieve. Christ lived by his own teaching of loving his enemy and turning the other cheek. This was preached by Christ on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. He continued entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. Let's look at that verse, verse uh, 23. Again, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. The basis of non-retaliation was his trust in God's righteous judgment. Whenever we respond in the flesh, it's because we want to take matters into our own hands. We want to be the judge, jury, and executioner. We want to justify ourselves. But what did Christ do? He was sinless and still endured the, the, the persecution because he trusted that God is the righteous judge. As Romans 12 tells us, vengeance belongs to the Lord. We read that a couple weeks ago. I refer you to that passage again, but won't take time to read it today. Every wrong deed, loved ones, every wrong deed in this universe will be either covered by the blood of Christ or repaid justly by God at the final judgment. Why? Because God is the judge of the universe. And he is a just judge. What about for Christians? who are covered by his blood. God's wrath against our sin was met in Jesus Christ, our Savior. We sang about that today, right? Justice has been satisfied. Right? God's wrath was satisfied. We read that in Isaiah 53 as well. And so God's judgment against the sin of those redeemed was punished and paid through Christ, those without Christ have to pay their own punishment to God, but God is just and he will 
justly reward and, and punish everybody. And so Christ, knowing that God is the just and righteous judge, trusted his situation to God the righteous judge. And that is our example to follow as well. Now I want to look at the results of Christ's unjust suffering. This, loved ones, is nothing new to us. But this, loved ones, is a time for us to rejoice, to review, and to worship our great God. What did Christ's endurance, his patient endurance of unjust suffering, what did that produce? Now we know it produced our salvation, right? And what Peter is doing with his people that he's writing to, his audience, he is reminding them once again, giving hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ to an inheritance that's imperishable, that they are being guarded by God's power at the, until the revelation of Jesus Christ when their salvation will be secure. And he's just telling them, your salvation, here's another concept of how your salvation is secure. Look at verse 24 and 25. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. Pause there. Who's, why did Jesus die on the tree? To bear sins. What, Jesus died on a tree to bear the sins of whom? Of us. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. Now, is that just? Is that fair? Now, I'm not speaking theologically. I'm thinking how we would consider. He was sinless and he was nailed to a tree because of whose fault? Whose responsibility? Mine. That's complete. The epitome of unjust suffering. He was sinless and yet nailed to a tree. Why? To bear my sins. That's not fair. But it was done absolutely as a substitute for me. Christ's death on the tree has no meaning unless it's in substitution for me. Amen! Here is the significance of our salvation. He himself bore Tig's sins in his body on the tree. And you can put your name there too. I didn't mean to be selfish. Why? So we could live however we want to, enjoy life, get all the gusto we can, enjoy our pleasures because you only go around once and then when you get to heaven, as long as you named Christ one day, then you have the best of both worlds. Oh no, oh, well, that's not what Peter says. Why? He bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you are straying like sheep, and sheep stray because they're stupid and they can't see well, and they just wander off into oblivion if the shepherd doesn't call them back. You were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul. By what means have, are we returned to the shepherd and overseer of our soul? By Jesus Christ's sacrifice to us. So let's look at the results of Christ's unjust suffering. Number one, believers are forgiven. Believers are forgiven. Look at the phrase, he bore our sins. This time, let's go back and review Isaiah 53. I asked you to bookmark it at the beginning of the, uh, the sermon. Uh, we read that today in our call to worship. But I just don't think you can ever get enough of Isaiah 53. So let's look at these truths here. And I'm just going to read through this to refresh our memory. And you will certainly see that Peter is drawing from Isaiah 53 in his epistle. Begin the reading in Isaiah 50, 53, verse 3. He was despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one 
And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne whose griefs? Our griefs. And Peter says, where did he bear them? On the tree. Remember that? Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by whom? By God, and afflicted. Why did God afflict his own son? Verse 5. But he was pierced for what reason? Our transgressions. I want to pause here and make a point of this. He was a pierced for what? Transgressions. Whose transgressions? Ours. He was absolutely a substitute for us. Surely he was, he, uh, did, where am I? First five. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed. Why? For iniquities. Whose iniquities? Ours. Upon him was the chastisement. That's the word, another word for punishment. Upon him was the punishment that brought us peace or brought peace to us. Peace with whom? To God. Who has peace with God through his punishment? We do. And with his wounds, we are healed. Now, pause there. I'll, I'll make a, a note of this, an emphasis of this in just a moment. But that phrase there, with his wounds, you are healed. Is that talking about physical healing or spiritual healing? Absolute spiritual healing. He was crushed. Why? For our transgressions. He bore our iniquities. We have peace with God. That's spiritual healing, right? It's not physical healing as some people claim. I'll, I'll mention that in just a moment. Verse 6, you'll recognize this from Peter as well. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him iniquity of whom? All of us. Let's go back to Peter, 1 Peter 2, and reread. Verse 24 and 25 again, and we'll see Isaiah 53 reference and drawn upon here. 1 Peter 2, 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you are straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Christ's suffering uniquely pays the penalty for our sins. Who, um, I'm trying to think of a, a better way to rephrase this. Christ suffered for our sins because the righteous judge demanded that sins be paid for. So whom did Christ's suffering satisfy? Satisfy the wrath of God. The phrase uh, Peter uses, he bore his, his sin, our sins in his body on the tree. That word on the tree alludes to being cursed by God. In the law, Deuteronomy 21 says, as cursed is everyone who is hanged upon a tree. It says that in other passages as well. Thus, Christ bore our curse as a substitute. And really, isn't that the penalty of sin. We talk about the fall of man into sin in Genesis 3, right? And that the world was blank because of sin. Cursed, right? Death was the penalty. Decay, disease, etc. was all the result of man's decision to rebel against God. Man fell from God's favor because of his sinfulness and God's holiness. And brought about the curse of sin. So the penalty of sin is being cursed by God. So in Christ, if Christ was nailed to a tree and cursed as everyone that's nailed to a tree, then Christ bore our curse for us. Follow? So Peter's just drawing on the fact that he bore our sins, he bore our curse all as an act of substitutionary atonement 
on our behalf. Also, we see not only believers forgiven, but believers pursue righteousness. I made mention of this as we read through the text, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Christ's death also empowers believers to live unto righteousness. His example, therefore, is not only to patiently suffer, but also to pursue righteousness. Did you get that? Christ provided an example for us to follow, not only to patiently endure unjust suffering, but also to pursue righteousness in the process of unjust suffering. And pursue righteousness in every other facet of life, no matter what our circumstances are, if we're suffering unjustly or if we're on the mountaintop, right? We're to pursue righteousness as he did. We see again Peter's emphasis on good works. We have to pursue righteousness. I do want to draw your attention to the repeated uh, emphasis on this. Look at chapter 2, verse 12. <clears throat> again, these, these are rings that we're going to see where Peter just repeats himself uh, and admonishes us to good works. Look at 2.12. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your what? Good deeds, and what's the result of them seeing our good deeds? They will glorify God on the day of visitation. Look at verse 15 of the same chapter. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Look at chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, uh, in regard to wives. Wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, some husbands don't obey the word, they may be won without a word by the what? conduct of the wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct look at chapter 3 verse 16 having a good conscience so that when you are slandered those who revile your what kind of behavior good behavior in Christ may be put to shame and then look at 419 therefore let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good this is the same example of Christ. Christ trusted in the righteous judge. And so we endure by trusting God's righteous judgments as well. So we are not only to simply just say, hey, I'm saved, I'm on my way to heaven, that's cool, and uh, we'll look forward to, to that. But while we pilgrim through this pathway, while we walk the pilgrim pathway, we must pursue righteousness. It's a call to righteousness, to live holy. Thirdly, not only believers forgiven, but believers are also, also spiritually healed. It says, by his wounds you have been healed. We made an emphasis when we read through the text. Is this referring to spiritual or physical healing? Spiritual healing. The context shows this does not mean physical healing as the prosperity gospel promotes. He bore our sins. We were returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Uh, in the charismatic movement, they will use this phrase, and you may hear it now that you're aware of it. They will use, by his wounds you have been healed, to pray for your physical healing. It is true that God can heal us physically. I'm not diminishing that, right? But it's not a guaranteed promise that we can be physically healed by prayer because by his wounds we're healed. And that's what they claim. Lord, heal the cancer. Lord, our faith is strong. And we just increase our faith. If it's weak, increase our faith. And, and heal my, our loved one. Raise him from the sickbed. Raise him from the deathbed. Because by your wounds we are healed. We claim that promise, O oh Lord. It's totally misappropriation of biblical context. I just want you to be aware that that exists out there. I'm curious. Anyone heard of that or seen that? Well, it's because you haven't been in a charismatic church for a long time. <laughs> some of them. Some of them. Anyway. Maybe you can help your friends who, who talk like that um, recognize the context and, and just try to walk them through that. And again, God can heal us if he wishes, 
but it's not an absolute promise we can claim if we have enough faith that God will heal our loved one because by his wounds we are healed. Okay? The, the context is spiritual healing, not physical. By his wounds may relate to the beaten servants who trusted God for ultimate salvation, who had unjust masters and they were beaten for it. Maybe Peter's making an appeal there. Just an idea that might be interesting to consider. So believers uh, are also returned to God. Amen. Isaiah says, your iniquities have separated you from God. What brings us back to God? The substitutionary, sacrificial payment of Christ when he bore our sins in his body on the tree. And by his stripes, we are spiritually healed and returned to the shepherd and overseer of our souls. Amen? Man, what a fantastic truth. So Peter's just reiterating, hey, man, this is who you are. This is what God's done for you, and this is what your salvation means. Look at verse 25 again. Again, pulling out of Isaiah 53, 6, we're all like sheep who have gone astray. Peter says, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. The fact that he mentions you were straying indicates that the healing received is from the punishment of wandering from the shepherd. That's a wordy explanation. Let me say it again. You were straying indicates that we were wandering from the shepherd, and therefore that incurs punishment from the shepherd. Therefore, it is forgiveness of sins, not physical healing, that we are, we are healed. Look at 318, chapter 318. Peter uh, reiterates this truth over here. First Peter 318, for Christ also suffered once for sins, righteous for the unrighteous. Was that just? No. Why? That he might do what? Bring us to God. The Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. What's the result? That he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Christ didn't stay dead. He rose again so that we are dead to our sins, alive to God. Our sins have been paid for, and we look forward to the resurrection unto eternal life. A lot going on there. And through Christ's sacrifice, we have been brought back to God. Jesus himself gave the parable in Luke 15 of the lost sheep. Remember what farmer having a hundred sheep and, and, and one goes astray, will he not leave the 99 in search of the sheep? And when he finds it, he puts it over his shoulders and comes back and there's rejoicing that my sheep has been found, right? Jesus Christ has not only chosen you, elected you from the, for the foundation of the world, but when you were lost, he came to this earth to die for your sins, to bear your iniquities, and to find you in your lostness, and to bring you back to God, to bring you home. And what happens when you are returned? There's rejoicing. There's rejoicing. We also see in John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. Not only who goes finds the sheep, but he does what for the sheep? Lays down his life for the sheep. Sacrificial atonement. The significance of, of Peter using the term the shepherd and overseer of your souls. You return to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Now, a lot of times we think of Christ as the good shepherd, and certainly he is. God is the chief shepherd, and we think about that in his uh, shepherding care for his sheep. He, and we go to Psalm 23, right? The, great, the Lord is my shepherd passage. And we go there and he, he leads us into uh, green pastures and beside the still waters and he anoints my head with oil and he prepares a table. And evil, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil for thou art with me. All of that's true about God, but that's not what Peter has in mind here. It's not about his gentle shepherding care. It's because he calls him the shepherd and overseer. 
Now, what responsibility does the shepherd also have, not in just his tender care, but in his oversight of the flock? What must the sheep do in order to receive the tender care? They must follow the shepherd, right? If a sheep leaves the flock and wanders into unknown pastures or strange pastures that he has to go be found, He's not under the shepherd's care. So what Peter is addressing here is that the one, the shepherd and the overseer is the one who has the authority over your soul. He is the leader, the ruler of your soul. Therefore, true conversion involves returning to Jesus as the ruler and the Lord and you following him as your shepherd, which also corresponds to the truth mentioned earlier he bore us in so that we could be dead to sin and live unto God. Jesus Christ is more than your ticket out of hell. He must be followed as Savior, Ruler, Lord, and Overseer of your soul. That is the proof of true salvation. Right? Any individual can use logic to answer the question hey, when you die, do you want to go burn in hell forever? Even a chimpanzee would answer no. Right? No. Okay, well, pray this prayer. Dear Jesus, dear Jesus, forgive me my sins, forgive me my sins, take me to heaven when I die, take me to heaven when I die. Oh, great, you're going to heaven. And then leave that guy. Is that true conversion? 99.99999% of the chance it's not going to be true conversion. Unless the Holy Spirit has moved that guy to that stage. But we're not talking about academic acknowledgement of, okay, I can pray a prayer and... I, I can get out of hell when it's all over, and then I'm just going to go back to my own life. True, authentic salvation in Christianity is proven by a life that follows the shepherd and overseer of your soul to whom you have been returned through the blood of Christ. Amen? And those of us who know this truth, desire this truth, and pursue this truth, it's still hard for us to live perfect lives. But that's why we pray in the pastoral prayer. Uh, a, a portion of that prayer is confession, right? God, we know what we ought to do and we don't do it. Apostle Paul even said that in Romans 7. The things that I know I should do, I don't do. The things I know I, sh I shouldn't do, that's what I do. Oh, wretched man that I am. But is God's grace sufficient to forgive us of our sins? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from most of the, our, our unrighteousness. All. All our unrighteousness, exactly. Our sins, they are many. But his mercy is more. Now, we can't presume upon that. I'm just going to go ahead and sin and get away. I'll just ask for forgiveness tomorrow. I'll be okay. That's not really the heart of a true follower. So it, it's a growing process. It's what we call progressive sanctification, growing in holiness so that we sin less than we did when a few years ago, <laughs> right? Because our, our salvation is being worked out. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Live it out. So... Uh, that's what is, is in view here. All right, in review, in verses 24 and 25, what is the result of Christ's unjust suffering? Believers are forgiven. Believers pursue righteousness. Believers are spiritually healed. And believers are returned to God. Amen? Amen. Therefore, in conclusion, and all God's people say, <laughs> in conclusion, we follow Christ's example of patiently enduring unjust suffering. He was the rejected stone, rejected by man, but he was accepted by whom? By God. 
we follow his example, remembering that our present salvation and future inheritance allow us to patiently endure, right? What, what, has you, what enables you to say, okay, I can endure this because I know it's going to get better. We follow Christ's faith in the just judge. We don't have to avenge ourselves. We leave vengeance to the Lord. We are healed and returned to the shepherd of our souls. Amen, 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 hallelujah. And again, this segment simply repeats the melody line of Peter where he says that as elect of God, the outcome of our salvation is sure, and thus we are sojourners and exiles in this life. As we travel this earth towards our uh, heavenly inheritance, we follow Christ's example of patiently enduring our trials and resisting the lust of the flesh. And by patiently enduring, living holy lives, loving one another and honoring our earthly authorities, we display the gospel to the world and we bring glory to Christ or to God. So after three weeks, we've gotten through that paragraph. Okay? A lot in there, a lot of good stuff, and I just wanted to uh, take our time. Uh, it's too rich. There's too much there to just skate through it. And uh, trust it's been a blessing to you. Now, yeah, to me, it's a slap in the face because, you know, I, I, my natural man takes over too much, right? So this was a, a, a rebuke and a reminder, but an encouragement as well that, hey, God is the just judge. Christ suffered the, the, the grossest of injustices, didn't he? He was sinless and yet nailed to a cross. Why? Because he bore our iniquities, our sins. And with his wounds, we are spiritually healed. All praise be to him. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the sacrifice of Christ on our behalf. We thank you for the substitutionary, sacrificial, fulfilling, complete, satisfying, propitiating atonement of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ on our behalf. And through that, we are brought back to God as the shepherd and overseer of our souls. Lord, may we determine not only to just accept God's, Christ's forgiveness for our sin debt, but then to, to, to leave that sin and to live for God. Lord, we just pray that your grace would just pour over us. May we be cognizant of your grace. May we pray for your grace. May we stop and pause in temptation, in persecution, whatever the negative may be in our life. May we just pause and say, God, your grace is sufficient. Give me your grace. Give me your patience. May I trust in you for the outcome. Lord, help me to do good works and to glorify you in this time. That's not natural for us, and so we'll need your grace. And we trust that the preaching of God's word, the studying of your word today will help us do that better in our lives. Use us for your glory. We thank you once again with innumerable praise. We lift up our soul and thank you, O oh Father, and our Savior Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit that resides within us. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you, and we love you. Help us to live for you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, in response to that, let's go ahead and close by singing a couple songs. There is a Redeemer, Jesus, God's own Son. And um, this will, uh, again, like always, it's in response and worship to what we've heard today about Jesus' substitutionary payment on our behalf. Let me invite you to stand and let's sing together.
one more for you. Years I spent in vanity and pride at Calvary. All right, let's sing that and we'll rejoice. After you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen.